All right, good morning. Good morning. So uh, we have some fun stuff for today's lecture. And uh, as far as the final is concerned and so on, I'd like, to for forget, I'd like you to forget about anything we do today. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, get, your, get your mind to become a blank and, uh, you know, forget anything you hear in today's lecture. So uh, what I'm going to show you today uh, hopefully will completely blow your minds. And I'm not talking about controlled substances or anything. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, show you a few things uh, that behave completely uh, and spectacularly differently than uh, how you expect them to. And uh, today's lecture is appropriately called Okay, so uh, we're going to violate the abstraction barrier here and do some fun things. And the, the important thing to realize is that, you know, in all of 6002, uh, we have, after all, based on some assumptions we made at the beginning of the course, like the lump matter discipline and so on, we have landed ourselves in this playground called the playground of 6002. And within that playground, certain ground rules apply. Okay, and our entire course depended on those assumptions being true. So for example, the first assumption we made that brought us from Maxwell's equations to the lumped matter discipline was, uh, or rather the circuit abstraction, was a lumped matter discipline. And there were three tenets of the lumped matter discipline. One is that uh, the, uh, the rate of change of flux was going to be zero within our circuits, uh, not inside elements, but uh, in the circuit itself. And second, the dq by dt was going to be zero outside the elements. And third, uh, something we did not dwell upon in the course, but it's certainly present in the course notes, is that the speeds of signals that we are going to consider are going to be much slower than the speed of light. Okay, so we're going to be working in a realm where we were going to be well slower than the speed of light. Okay, so uh, starting with that, let me walk you through um, let me walk you through some, uh, some examples and some uh, fun stuff. <clears throat> so the first case is called the double take. So uh, let me sketch out a small little uh, circuit for you. And... Uh, take a look at the expected behavior, and then show you what really happens in uh, real life. So in the first case, I have a voltage uh, source. And what I'm going to do is make a transition from a 0 to a 1. Think of it as a step input. And through a uh, Thevenin-like uh, resistance, I'm going to feed it to a circuit. The circuit uh, will go to a, uh, an inverter. This node goes to an inverter and goes through some other, some other circuits within our own uh, design here. So again, remember, a step input here, and the input goes to, uh, through a Thevenin-like resistance, uh, goes, is applied to some other circuit elements. So uh, if I apply a step here, what do you expect? You expect that, so let me call that... Uh, VI, and let me call that VO. So uh, if I plot VI as a function of time, and let's say the step input happens at t equal to 0. So let's say this is t equal to 0 here. And let's say this is a 5-volt step. So I expect that this input here is going to go to VI here is going to go to 5 volts, okay, uh, at t equal to 0. What do I expect at VO? 
at VO, based on a circuit abstraction, you know, I get a step input here. Okay, I should get a step of some magnitude here. Okay, depending on what's connected in uh, this direction. And let's simply say that what's connected here is an inverter and maybe other inverters at the other side. So essentially, as far as this node is concerned, it's got some wires connected to it. And at the end of the wires, it has an open circuit. An open circuit, for example, like the gate input of this inverter. So what do you expect at V0? Uh, step input here. And at V0, I see an open circuit. OK, so I expect the same step at V0. 5 volts. So that's what we prepared you for. OK? But the fun thing that we're going to see, so this is, uh, this is what you expect. And uh, I'll show you a little demo that is going to show you something very different. What you're going to see is not this. Okay, you ain't going to be seeing that. Rather, I'm going to show you something that looks like this. So at t equal to 0, I do see the input, uh, I do see VO looking like a step, and approximately halfway through, it decides, ah, well, never mind, and flattens out. Okay, then says, oh, okay, and boom, it goes back up to 5 volts. So it, it, sort of, it sort of does a, you know, a, a bit of a double take out there, saying, hey, what, what's going on here? And boom, jumps up to 5 volts, and then it's uh, 5 as you expect. Okay, so this is uh, some finite amount of time, and it looks like that. Okay? So try to understand what's going on. So let me show you a quick, uh, uh, quick little demo. So that's the uh, input VI. Okay, so that's the input VI that you expect. And I won't do anything to my circuit at this point. And uh, go ahead. So uh, let's see what happens now. There you go. So now I'm showing you the output here at uh, VO. So at VI, it was a nice little step. And at VO, notice that I get something that behaves like this. Okay, and I promise you, nothing we've taught you in 6002 prepares you for this. Okay, and, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, uh, you know, it, it would behoove you to uh, forget about everything you learned in today's lecture uh, for, the next, uh, for the next two weeks at least. So, uh, so what's going on here? Any ideas? Anybody? Any, any thoughts? So what's, what's up with my circuit here? It says, oh, okay, hey, step. Starts off and says, oh, never mind, you know, and then meanders along at 2.5 volts and then says, oh, step, yes, that's all I remember. Boom, it jumps up to 5 volts. So any, any theories? Any guesses? Any wild guesses? OK. So let me draw you a little bit more uh, of a detailed circuit and uh, see if we can explain what's going on here. So the circuit that I've drawn there is not quite uh, the circuit I have, uh, at least in terms of my wires. So what I have is something that looks like this, VI. And this is going to step to. Uh, 5 volts. I do have a resistance R. This is VO. This does go to an inverter. But what is also happening is that I have a long wire. OK, you see this guy here? That we had one of our union folks, you know, uh, so stretch out all along the floor here. You have a really long wire that connects to uh, the VO node, and uh, and there's also a long corresponding ground. So this wire is a coaxial cable that is used for uh, you know Ethernet and such such like. It's got a it's got a core that carries a signal, and around the core is shielding 
that is the ground. Uh, that is the ground. Okay, so that goes a long way, and at the end, it is open. Okay, it's an open circuit at the end. I've, I haven't connected anything out there. Open circuit. So uh, you know, uh, so something's happening here that's making the circuit behave like this. So. So this is VI. At VO, so at VO, I'm getting this funny behavior. OK, so uh, does anybody want to take, uh, with the next, next piece of clues here, does anybody want to take a stab at guessing what might be going on here? Yes. Okay. Okay. Ah, we have a shill in the audience here. So, um, so, uh, so the theory is that there is a uh, the step here is actually a uh, think of it as an electromagnetic pulse that goes from zero to five, and you know things in real life don't travel instantaneously. So it's it's there's something about a wave that flies down. And the wave goes to the end, flips, and then comes back, and then establishes the full voltage here. So that is indeed, uh, uh, indeed at the root of what's going on. And uh, let me uh, put it in layman's terms and uh, describe the uh, details of what's going on here. OK. So uh, the way to view what's going on is that I have this long wire. Okay, in the very first lecture, I started off by saying wires are ideal. Okay, ideal wires are such that. You know, I can transmit signals on them. Wires are small, so that the propagation time of signals is inconsequential compared to the uh, uh, rise times and fall times of the signals of interest. Okay, but having this really long cable here, I have clearly violated that assumption, which is my wires are really, really a wire is really, really long here. Okay, and so I somehow need to model what the wire is doing to my circuit when, I've, uh, when I don't have a small wire. So what actually happens? So uh, the way to view it is the following. So although this is a wire, to understand the mechanics of what's going on, I really have to model it much more accurately. Okay? And the way to model a wire like this is that notice that every small element of a wire has associated with it some inductance. Okay, so let's take a small segment of uh, the coax cable here. The coax cable is a small core surrounded by a metallic shield. Okay, that's a ground. And so when you have a wire surrounded by a metallic shield, that also has a capacitance, okay, inductance and capacitance. So this small segment can be modeled as a really small inductance and a really tiny capacitance. Similarly, the next segment can be modeled as a tiny inductance and a capacitance. There is also a resistance here, but let's assume that the resistance is, 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 is zero for our model, and also the parallel resistance is also zero. I'm sorry, uh, is infinity. Okay, so it's an inductor capacitor, and really the situation that I have is not a pair of ideal wires, but really a really, really small inductance and a capacitance, a small capacitance in parallel. So it's more of a set of distributed elements that I have here. Notice that in, in my lump circuit abstraction, when we talked about the RLC model for the wire between two inverters, we lumped it. We lumped this thing into a model that looked like this. Okay, we lumped the resistance into a source resistance. We lumped all the inductors into a lumped inductor. We lumped all the capacitances into a lumped capacitance. Okay, now in this situation, I can do this when the signal speeds of interest are much, much, much slower than, than speed of light. Okay, than the, the propagation speeds of electromagnetic signals. In this case, that is not quite true. And so therefore, we have to model it much more exactly. We need to see what's, what's going on. So what's happening here is that 
At time t equals zero, I get this uh, step. So think of that as a pulse of energy. And uh, the instant it comes here, at the, at instantaneously, this guy looks like a voltage divider. Okay? Um, I've chosen my resistance R here to match the instantaneous impedance looking in, which is also R. I've just arranged it to be that way. So instantaneously, the, uh, the point at which the pulse appears at this point, looking down here, looks like a, another resistor to this pulse. Okay, therefore, when I start out, I start out going up and pausing at 2.5, because instantaneously, this looks like a resistance R. So instantaneously, it's an R, a voltage divider R, and so it's 2.5 here, instantaneously. Okay, then what happens? Then this little pulse propagates down. What does it mean for a pulse of energy to propagate down? Well, I begin charging up the, the induct, you know, begin sending a current through the inductor, begins charging up the capacitor, current here, you know, bzz, bzz, so that's, that's what I mean by saying that uh, the pulse of energy goes down. Okay, it's a step that sends current through the inductor and charges up the capacitors, and that wave front moves out here and comes all the way here. What happens there? Well, think about it. Supposing you stand here and you, have a, you, you hold a, uh, you know, a long string in your hand somehow, and so just do the Gedanken experiment. It's not easy to do. And so let's say you somehow have uh, the long string that you're holding on to, and that string on the other side is not connected to anything. Okay, just imagine this experiment. Okay, and what you do is you suddenly uh, raise the string up at your end by about a foot. Okay? So what are you going to see happen? So instantaneously, the string is up here, but the rest of the string is down a foot below. And then you see this wave, this, this wave propagate down the string, right? So here's a string. I lift this thing, and you see this wave propagate all the way down, the one foot wave propagate all the way down, okay, until you come here. What happens here? So out here, the string is down here, the wave propagates out here, and pulls it up to one. And then what? There's nothing connected there. So, so the string has come up, uh, you know, it's zipped up, but it's got this energy. Okay, where does the energy go? Well, it continues going up and sends the wave back. Okay, so just think of the string that you pull up like this, it propagates down, boom, it hits the other end, reverses, and comes back at me. Okay, um, you can look at a complementary situation, not the same as this, but complementary, by taking a string, tying it to a door, and lifting it up. It's not the same situation, it's a complementary situation, but it's tied down. Uh, tying down a string is tantamount to shorting the ends here. Okay, in that case, what you'll see happen is the wave goes down, at the end, the string can't move, so wave goes in, flips around, and comes back. Okay, try it out at home. Uh, take a long piece of string, tie it out there, do this, okay? And you'll see the wave go out, flip, and then come back at you. So if, uh, you know, uh, your friends see you tying long piece of string and doing this, uh, hopefully they won't think you're nuts or something. Okay. So, so the same way here, this thing flies down, okay? There's no way to dissipate the energy here, so this thing continues up. And then what I'm going to see happen is the wave move back. Okay, so wave begins to move back, and that's another 2.5 volts, resulting in a net 5 volts at this terminal. That wave begins to blast back, okay, and then when it comes back here after some amount of time, it raises this to 5 volts, and that's what you see happen here. So this is a wave going down, and then after a time 2t, it goes back up to 5 volts, that's a return wave. It's 2t because to get down here is t seconds, and then t seconds to come back, which is why we have 2t. Okay, that is why you see that pulse at 2.5. Okay, so I'd like to show you a, a, a few more things here. Now, clearly, we don't, want, uh, we don't want that in our circuits. Now, can someone tell me what problem might happen if, uh, if my signals looked like this in my digital circuits? Instead of being nice little steps, if there was, you know, like a little thing in the middle and then a step, What's the problem with signals like this in digital circuits? What did the violate? Yeah. Exactly. You know, the, 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 this little sucker here is meandering around in the forbidden region for all of two capital T. Can't do that. Okay, can't have that. Well, so we need to fix the problem because this is real life. 
Okay, but what if you and your buddy, you know, are signaling each other, we're using digital signals, you know, from one dorm room to another, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a few hundred feet down, your circuits ain't going to work because it's, the signal's going to meander around in the forbidden region for some time. So any ideas? What might you do? Yeah. Put a resistor on the end. Okay? Trick the circuit. So what you can do, and, and I'll show you a little demo here, what you can do is the reason I got this way of propagating back was that there was nothing to absorb the energy. So instead, what if I put another resistor here, R? So as far as the burst of energy is concerned, it says, oh, yeah, you know, it just looks the same. It's R. And goes in and dissipates in this resistor R. And guess what? I don't have any wave going back, and I'm done. So what I'm going to find then is that out here, this goes up to 5 volts. But out here, I will have a signal that starts out and goes up to 2.5, and that's it. OK, I lift it up, bzz, it goes down goes to 2.5. Because in the lumped model that you've been dealing with, it's a resistor R, a resistor R to ground, and you're taking this, uh, the connection here, so, or here, and so it's your standard lumped model, a vo voltage resistive divider, and it just simply work. Yeah, let's see. So, uh, so this is the end of the cable. Okay, if somehow you could watch this and that at the same time, so what I'm going to do, and this is a resistor R, I'm just going to plug it in. Okay, if the fates are smiling, smiling at me, what should you see there? What should happen is that the second jump from 2.5 to 5 should simply go away. You know, and should just go to 2.5. Let's try that. There you go. I take it out. Jumps back up. Okay, so all I've done here is put in a resistor at the end, and I'm still measuring the voltage here. <clears throat> so, uh, so that's one solution. One solution is to put a resistor here, so I absorb the energy, and the resistance has to be equal to the instantaneous impedance looking in. That instantaneous impedance, for, for many of these cables, is 50 ohms. It's called a characteristic impedance. Okay, you learn a lot more about it if you take six, uh, 6014. Okay, that course starts out with, uh, uh, you know, assuming that things are distributed in that manner. Okay, and so if you want to design, you know, uh, multi-gigahertz chips, it turns out that if you have signals that are traveling around at edges of, edge speeds of, uh, in the 0.1 to 1 nanosecond range, remember, you know, light travels roughly 1 nanosecond a foot. And if your signals are roughly of interest are 0.1 nanoseconds, then if your chips are one inch, if your chips are one inch in size, right there, you know, you've, uh, the propagation speed of a signal across a chip is 0.1 nanoseconds. Okay, so, you so today we have to deal with these issues and, 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 and try to figure out what to do about them. Okay, so that was one solution that somebody pointed out. There is a second solution. Anybody else have a second solution for me? And then there's a third solution, too. So it's okay. You can give me either the second or the third solution. doesn't matter. Anybody? You have two to choose from. Come on. Yeah. Oh, we could do that. Yeah. So, you know, we could define the problem, problem away by saying, uh, you know, uh, this transition is such that my high is below 2.5. So once it goes above 2.5, who cares what it does? That's a that's good point. That's, that's solution number four. But, and, and that works. Okay, so I still need two and three. Put a diode in there. Yeah, I guess you could, you know, if, if the diode had the same kind of impedance looking in, uh, it, it kind of may work. That's solution uh, 4.2. I'm still waiting for solution two and three. Pardon? Cut off the cable, exactly. So the solution says, work on a different problem. Okay, so... And, that's, and that is solution number two, okay? So the, so the idea is the root, of all, the root of all evil was this long wire, which is why I had, I had this thing here. 
So instead, if I had short wires, then what will happen is that if it's a very small wire, it'll look like this. And the wire is small enough, I'll just see a little itty bitty thingamajig out there, but not, but, but not a whole lot. By the way, um, the fun thing is that you can actually calculate the speed of light, the experiment I just showed you. In the can I put that up if you can? No, the, the big one. <clears throat> so in the experiment that I showed you, this distance was about 500 nanoseconds. Okay? This, this distance is 500 nanoseconds, this, this time interval. The length of this cable is about, I don't know, maybe 500 feet. It's about 500 feet. So you can figure out the speed of light. What's the speed of light? So this, this is about 500 nanoseconds, and this cable is roughly 500 feet. What's the speed of light? Roughly a foot per nanosecond. So would you believe that at the end of 6002 we figured out the speed of light from a simple experiment? All right, so then let's do the next experiment now. Let's take out the long cable and connect a short cable instead. So what I'm going to do is uh, disconnect the long cable and instead connect a small cable. It's still relatively long, but it's much shorter than the 500-foot cable. So what you should see happen now is that the little step should not be, you know, not be this big, but much, much smaller. So take a look up there. There you go. Okay, so with this, uh, with this thingamajig, the little bub blip there is very small. And of course, if I make it even smaller, uh, that, that can virtually vanish. Okay, so uh, that is solution Solution number two. So we've done one, two, four, four point two. So what's solution number three? One more solution. Pardon? <clears throat> so the, another solution mentioned is that change this, uh, uh, change this resistance. Yeah, that'll work. If I make this very, very low, then I'll get much closer to five volts here. Yeah, that, that, that's a possibility. That's solution uh, six, I guess. So what about solution number three? And, and you all should be able to solve this. You guys know the answer, okay? You folks have, uh, you should be able to solve this. Yes? Ah, clock. So what I can do is, just as was pointed out, that I, I, uh, I leverage my abstraction by changing my VOH and uh, VIH thresholds. So that'll work. The alternative thing is to use a clock. A clock is a distinguished signal that I send around in my digital circuit. Okay, so all I do is if I arrange it such that my clock doesn't happen in this vicinity, but rather my clock happens late enough, then I'm going to sample and look at my signals only on the rising and falling edges of the clock, in which case I won't be looking at the signal when the signal is doing weird things. Okay, so the clock would also, uh, a decent clock would also solve the, uh, solve the problem. Okay, any last minute questions? before we go on to the next, uh, the next one. Okay, the next uh, problem that we're going to uh, look at uh, is titled the double dip. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do here is I have a VS power supply, and what I'm going to do is feed the power supply to <clears throat> an inverter. Okay, so we've been doing this all along, VS. I feed the supply to an inverter, and uh, what I'm also going to do is, so this is ground, I'm going to feed it to So feed the power supply connection to a couple of inverters. Okay? And what I'm going to do is uh, apply some sort of a signal uh, to this inverter. And I'm going to observe I'm going to look at this signal here. 
So your abstraction should tell you that here's a power supply. This is five volts or whatever the supply voltage is, these two inverters. That should be fine. And feed some sort of input to this inverter. Okay? And the output here should be simply determined by this input. Okay, this, this signal should have absolutely no bearing on this output. Okay? And uh, let's look at that and actually confirm it. So I'm, I've built a circuit like this, and we'll look at this output. And initially, you know, there should not be any, it should simply work fine. Okay. So it should simply work now, right? Good. Okay. <clears throat> so what you have here, this input here is the input that I'm feeding to this inverter. That is a straight line. Is that the power supply or? Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so I believe this is the, we'll check in a few minutes, but I suspect this is the uh, power supply. And this guy here is, a, is the output looking here. So the green one is the look here part. Okay. So uh, there must have been a one to zero transition here. And that's all fine. So, so far, so good. Okay. No problem so far. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something to this circuit. Okay, that as far as the abstraction is concerned, it doesn't show up on the circuit. Okay, it's below the abstraction layer. Okay, I'm going to do something, and suddenly fun things are going to happen. Look up there. The circuit hasn't changed. The same circuit. I've done nothing to the circuit. Okay, look at the green. Uh, the green output. I've done nothing to the circuit that is visible here. Okay, it's below the radar screen here. It's below the abstraction barrier. But look at the disaster. Look at the disaster here. Okay, in particular, <clears throat> the uh, spikes going up are not so much of a problem because, uh, because of the uh, static discipline. If I'm at five or six or seven, doesn't matter as long as I'm higher than VOH. So as long as I'm higher than VOH, I don't have a problem. But the problem are these repeated dips. Okay, the dips are a problem here, which is why I labeled this experiment the double dip. The dips are, are bad because if they are large enough, they can then droop the output down into the forbidden region, or worse yet, make it look like a zero. Okay, so you're not prepared for this. So what I'm going to do is tell you what I did to the circuit, and then ask you to help me figure it out. <laughs> so all I did was apply the load resistance to this. I think 50 ohms or some, some RL. I just, I, I just applied a load resistor. And this inverter here, <clears throat> I believe, is a MOS, is a CMOS inverter that looks... Okay? So I have this input applied to this inverter, and all I did is applied an RL load here. I notice that the, the load here should not really change what's happening if this is an, if this is an ideal inverter. Okay? The, the load here should simply draw some current, but really should not change any other property. Okay, so uh, just remember, what's the signal doing? The signal is high. This guy turns on, and and uh, and the uh, current flows like uh, you know uh, like this. So th let's say I have some sort of a capacitor here, discharges like this, and when it's low, the P FET is on, and current flows through here, down here. And then when this goes high, uh, this guy goes off, and this guy turns on. Okay, so the current flows out this way and discharges through this guy. When I turn it off, the PFET turns on and draws current from the top. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> do we have uh, any theories as to why I'm getting that, uh, why I'm getting that messy stuff, the, 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 the dips and the spikes on the uh, output of this inverter? So why does this inverter care 
what the load on this inverter is. I mean, who cares? So any, uh, so put your thinking caps on, any theories? You guys did pretty well with the previous one. So th this is much easier, actually, so. Uh, need a better power supply. Okay, let's, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace the power supply. And instead, use a much bigger power supply at five volts. Big Mongo power supply can supply 100 amps. And guess what? So I've made the changes, but guess what? I still see the spikes. Good, uh, good try, but uh, didn't work out. Good try, good try. Okay, what next? Any other solutions? Yes. So dips are because of the resistance and the spikes are because of the inductance. Uh, well, you're half correct. So uh, uh, which one is it now? So dips are because of resistances and spikes are because of inductances. You're half correct. It turns out that both the dips and the spikes are because of inductances. Okay, but uh, be that as it may, let me give you the next, uh, the next piece of, next clue here, and then see if you can uh, uh, come closer to the answer. So what I've done here <clears throat> is I've made this wire really, really long. Okay, it's a really long wire. Okay, but it's a thick wire. So it's a Mongo thick wire. So it's not the resistance. It's really, really thick in Mongo. <coughs> and it's got some, it's a long wire. So a, a signal wire into, above a ground plane behaves like an inductor. And so here, it has a capacitance too, but in this case, it's inductance. So there's an inductance here. So I'll give you another 10 seconds to think about it and, uh, and then tell you the answer. But despite the inductance here, <coughs> it turns out if I take out this resistor, it, the problem doesn't, problem goes away. Look, I take out the resistor, problem goes away. There is a, yes, there is an inductor here, <coughs> okay? I take out this resistor, problem goes away. I put the resistor back in, boom, yes. Uh, 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 pretty good. That's 86 points. So, um, so here's how. So, so, so here's what's going on. There's an inductor here, and when I put a 50 ohm resistor here, I put this resistor. When the PFET turns on, it, it draws a current. Okay, it's going to draw a current. If it draws a current, remember that I have a across an inductor, I have a drop, and the drop relates to DIDT. Remember, for a capacitor, uh, the current is C dV dt. For inductor, the voltage across the inductor is L dI dt. So if dI dt, if I'm switching a large current through the inductor every cycle, okay, big dI dt, okay, it's, dI dt is large. I made it large by having a, a very small RL. So I'm you know, pulling a big current through you know, every few, uh, whatever, uh, si every cycle, and then stopping it. And so therefore, I'm getting these big drops across this inductor uh, that relate to LDIDT. In other words, the, the power supply here is fine. You know, while you guys are watching, I, I, I switched in a huge Mongo power supply. And so this, you know, well, this voltage is fine. But then this voltage after the wire is the problem. So this voltage here doesn't look like this anymore. Rather, it has... Rather, it has spikes that go down, for example, and when I switch the other way, they go up. Okay, so therefore, what I end up having here is big spikes on this power supply, and when this guy's power supply gets, goes wacko, then uh, I see the spikes on its output as well. Okay, so uh, what are the solutions to that? Any solutions here? What can I do to fix the problemo? Pardon? Stop using the, exactly, when in doubt, do something else, build a different design. So what I could do is, this was pretty dumb, using a long wire. 
And so, uh, no, but trust me, oftentimes, you know, you, you go to the storeroom and they give you a big roll of wire and you're too lazy to cut a piece out. Use the, use the whole roll and, you know, use the two ends and connect it in. Okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so if I had a much shorter piece of uh, uh, wire, then uh, that, that can solve my problem. But again, remember that what's small to you may not be small to the circuit. Okay, so let's say, for example, I'm Intel, and I'm building a 10 gigahertz, you know, uh, Pentium 6 processor. Okay, it's, uh, uh, you know, 0.1 nanosecond is my cycle time. There, even a small itty-bitty, you know, uh, itty-bitty wire can be a real problem. Okay, and so therefore, distributing power throughout a one-inch chip that's clocking at 10 gigahertz is a really, really hard problem. Okay, and uh, you know uh, our own uh, David Perrault, uh, who is uh, you know doing one of our sections, you know the world's experts in this field. You know, how do you just distributing power? Something as simple as you know how do I get one volt you know, in a stable manner to every single device on my chip is a hard problem. Okay, so now you have to begin treating your power supply connections much like RC circuits, RLC circuits. Okay, and 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 you have to solve some hard problems to be able to just simply distribute power decently throughout your circuit. <clears throat> so, uh, what else can I do? Yeah. Say it again. Ah, I could do that. So, what I could do is I could use different wires to connect each of the inverters. That's a good point. So, here it, it, the coupling happens because uh, I connect the two inverters way out here. So, instead, I use, you know, I use a different cable I hadn't thought of that. That's a creative solution. Okay. So, so in fact, um, if you build a chip, uh, so we uh, we built this chip called RAW uh, in our group, and it has on the order of uh, 10 million gates. And this chip uh, we built with IBM's technology, and it turns out that what you don't send power supply in through a pin and then connect that 5 volt or 1.5 volt supply to all your gates. What you do is from that pin, you then build special power supply buffering trees. And each tree, each uh, leaf of the tree drives a sub-circuit. In other words, if this is your chip, <clears throat> you have lots and lots of gates throughout your chip. What you do not do is bring in your power supply like this and then connect, you know, uh, you don't do that. That's the worst possible thing you can do. I mean, it's, it's an absolute disaster. Okay, for the reason just brought up. So instead, what you do, <coughs> instead what you do is you divide up the chip into, let's say, four quadrants. Okay, in our case, we had 16 quadrants. And then what you do is from this point, you take one wire that goes to this quadrant, one wire that comes here, one here, and one here. So that you're, you're getting the power supply very close to the source, and you have different connections going to each quadrant. Okay, so that switching in this quadrant do not affect this guy because of the inductance of this lead here. Okay, and if you hadn't taken 002, uh, you'd have been arguing with IBM, you know. I, I don't want 16 wires. I want just one wire. Okay, so uh, there are other solutions, of course. Uh, 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 there's one more. There are a couple more solutions. One is that <coughs> what you can do is... Part of the problem here is that all my, my transitions are really, really sharp. Okay, so DIDT is very, very large. <clears throat> so there's a whole new technique in, in, in design of digital and analog circuits, which, which, which talks about, it's called wave, you know, maybe I should call it waveform engineering. Okay, or edge engineering. Okay, it's also called edge smoothing. The idea is that rather than have very sharp edges in your circuit, you try to have <clears throat> smoother edges. And when you have smoother edges, okay, then your DIDT is now going to be less. It's not going to be very, very high. Rather, it's going to be spread out. Your DIDT is now, your delta I is spread out over a longer period of time. Of course, that means the circuits may have to run a little slower, but that can also solve the problem. And in fact, uh, that same smoothing of the waveforms was also the solution you saw in the, uh, uh, in the uh, pin coupling, the capacitive coupling thing we saw uh, about a month and a half ago. And let me show you the demo and then, uh, and then close up. Not working? Okay, that's okay. It doesn't matter. 
Um, so if you remember the uh, if you remember the demo from uh, the lecture. Uh, About uh, a uh, month and a half ago in capacitors, I talked about a chip with uh, two pins, and there was uh, this capacitive coupling between the pins. And because of this, if this waveform is switching, then because of this coupling, you will end up getting, if this is the signal here, you will, you will end up getting spikes on this pin because of the signaling of the other pin. And that's good old capacitive coupling. Okay, and to eliminate this, what you can do is much like with the inductance system, if you rather than having sharp transitions on this pin, if you have smooth transitions that look like this, then what you can do is you now spread delta V from here to here over a longer delta T. Okay, Your delta T's become longer, and because of that, you end up getting much better behavior, and you don't end up getting these spikes. So therefore, if you want to build really, really fast circuits, you have to be really careful. You can build fast circuits, but watch out for them fast edges. Okay, fast edges are nasty. They kill you. Okay, that's something to remember uh, as you build the next uh, you know, generation of circuits. Well, thank you all. I had a blast, and I hope uh, you, know, you guys had fun too. Thank you. <laughs>